want to start by asking you a question. That is, where do you stand with God? Um, do you believe or are you an atheist? Do you know exactly how you feel or do you have any doubts? Whatever it is, something has brought you here. And this is a good starting point for you. We live in a very busy world and most people um, don't want to give the time or the effort to stop and to think about God. It's just too big a question. However, I want to show you the Bible and its message um, tonight. And, and we will take some time to, to focus on what it has to say and to see why it's the word, word of God and why it's worthy of our time and our attention. Uh, I'll give three examples um, for us to think about of, of why we can believe in God and the Bible is the Word of God. And then I want to talk about what the implications of that are. If God is real and we can trust in the Bible to be the Word of God, then, then what does that mean for us? Firstly though, um, we're all very busy and we're getting busier. We, on average, are working um, more hours a week, and an increasing number of us are working more than 48 hours a week. So the general trend is that uh, you know people are working longer hours. Um, according to figures from the Trade Union Congress, stress is the main health and safety hazard at work. Um, which isn't really very surprising. Um, um, and, and it trumps all other health and safety hazards, you know, like falling off ladders or things like that. Um, and of course, it affects all workers, and around a fifth of workers are affected by stress. Um, now, the human attention span is actually shorter than a goldfish now. We all like to joke about it and say, oh, we've got a attention span like a goldfish. Well, on average, the human attention span is actually shorter than a goldfish. Um, figures released by the National Center for Biotechnology Information earlier this year show that the attention span um, in 2000 is 12 seconds, and the attention span in 2013 had dropped to help them catch up. So it was 12 seconds in 2000, and in 2013 it's dropped to eight seconds. And a goldfish's attention span just pips us to the post at nine seconds. So um, it's quite shocking, really. This is um, largely thought to be due to social media. And if you think about that, well, whilst you're you know, scrolling down on uh, Facebook or whatever it is you're doing, um, might be looking at something, oh, you're distracted by something else, aren't you? I mean, you click on that and then you, and before you know it, an hour's gone. But you're not actually ever focusing on one particular thing, you're flitting around. Um, so, yes, we're definitely stressed, we're busy. And we don't ever stop to think about any one thing for any particularly long amount of time. Um, unfortunately though, there's no quick way to get to know the Bible. We have to read it, and even try to study it, to try and get to know what it's saying. But it is worth your attention. Um, so here are some strong reasons then, as to why you should believe in God and, and trust the Bible as the Word of God. And now, before we start, I want to say that I'm no expert in the fields that I'm about to talk about. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade, if you were interested. But these are subjects that, if you search for them on Google, you would get thousands of hits. So if you want to, you can go and you can check what I've said. Um, the first thing um, is 
this idea of the first great cause. So, how did we get here? This, of course, is the old the age old conundrum, but it still really stands unanswered. Science cannot tell us how the world first came into being. It can only fear us. It has this theory of the Big Bang, which is its idea. Um, <coughs> but even then, that's not addressing the root of the issue. You could potentially keep on asking how, 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 and, and say, well, that's how it happened. It happened in a Big Bang, or whatever you want to, to say happened. Um, but eventually, it's only natural for us as humans to ask why. Of course, science is a study of how, and as such, it doesn't really address why. In fact, certain scientists would shun the word why and say that it's an unscientific word. Um, and so this leaves you with a choice. Either you accept that life has no ultimate purpose, that you will never know why we are here, and that everything that happens to you is completely down to chance, or you just ask a simple question of why. Many people, and some scientists included, believe in this idea of this first great cause, and um, that there is some kind of a God, or being, or whatever, that set everything in motion. Now, even if they believe that he no longer cares for us, they believe in something that set everything in motion because there just has to be something that started everything off. The next idea um, is this idea of creation astronomy. So when we consider the planets and uh, space and stars, that there are myriads of confounding questions and, and fascinating details which cry out um, that the universe has been created by a very intelligent and even artistic design. Um, so, first thing is the sun. Uh, the sun is a very stable star. Now, most stars give off um, things what are called solar flares. Um, and, and they can uh, massively expand or even reduce in the amount of energy that they give off, sometimes up to like 300%. Now, if you can imagine that our sun was to do that, uh, and it was to, you know, decide, for well, today I'm going to give off 300% extra amount of heat, then that would be bye-bye Earth, all life on Earth and everything, wouldn't it? Or the opposite might be true as well. It could be solar winter for however long it decided it was going to be 300% colder. Um, as an interesting fact, what, what you can see there on the screen, that's a real picture of the sun that was taken in, I think it was 2013, uh, in ultra UV. So you can see the surface of the sun in, in really high detail. That thing you can see coming out of the surface of the sun is something called a solar prominence. Um, so the, the surface of the sun is, is really turbulent, um, and sometimes areas uh, break away in, in a solar prominence, um, and, and they form a sort of an arch shape, almost like they're the, almost like a a dolphin would you know, dive out of water, it's, sort of, it's like it's diving out of the surface of the sun and then and, and going back in again. Um, and, and they last for several weeks and they can gain enormous size, these um, arch prominence things. Um, the one in the picture there is considerably bigger than the planet Jupiter. You could fit Jupiter really comfortably in the little arch there. Um, and the biggest one ever recorded is 500,000 miles long, which is pretty much the diameter <coughs> of the sun itself. So it just shows you how crazy these things are. 
So, um, we've already touched on it, but the sun is perfect for us. Uh, most stars give off, uh, sorry, no, bigger stars than us, our star, uh, bigger stars than our star, most stars are bigger than our star, and, and, and bigger ones give off um, large amounts of ultraviolet light, which of course would be very harmful for our skin. Um, um, and, and smaller stars, for example, you know, you get the red dwarf stars, give off um, more infrared light as compared to visible light. And so that means that to have um, live, sort of livable heat conditions, you'd have very dim light conditions. Um, if the sun was any closer to the center of the galaxy, then we may pick up harmful radiation from, it, from the center. If it was any closer to the edge of the galaxy, then we would only have stars in, in half of the sky. Um, and we might be difficult to track seasons. Um, and that's just, just a little taste of just uh, sort of how coincidental it is that uh, we are orbiting this particular star. And the next thing uh, is, is Venus. So in the secular scenario, as we call it, the solar system is supposed to have formed um, from the collapse of a rotating nebula. Um, now I'm not entirely sure well, that means myself either, but apparently this means um, that all of the planets should spin at about the same rate, and they should spin in the same direction. So that's not the case. The planets spin different speeds, and, and Venus is very interesting because it actually spins in the opposite direction to all of the other planets. Um, and uh, you know that there are many other things that I'd love to tell you about the stars and about, about the planets. You know, Mercury, for example, is fascinating. Um, however, we don't have time right now. And despite the amazing things that we can see and that we can marvel at in space, it really is Earth that God is um, concerned with the most. Um, Space in the Genesis creation account is, is pretty much summed up with the words, he made the stars also. So everything on earth is designed to support life. So as compared to our barren and bleak neighbours, um, life is teeming all over our planet. Uh, Earth is the only planet known to contain liquid water. And again, it, it's not just a, you know, a little tiny drop of liquid water here. It's, it's teeming all over the planet. 70% of the surface is covered in liquid water. Um, the, the Earth's axis is, of course, tilted at 23.4 degrees which is precisely right. Um, any less would shelter the poles from the sun, uh, so you'd get bigger ice caps on the poles, and you'd get smaller uh, livable areas. Um, any more of an axial tilt might mean you get extreme seasons. Um, and again, that, that might be very difficult livable conditions. So, um, uh, you know, very hot summers and very cold winters. Um, another thing, um, our moon. Uh, the, the, it is very different from any other moon um, around any of the other planets. Um, but uh, it, it's crucial to life on Earth. Um, it stabilizes Earth's orbit, first of all. 
So, um, without, um, as we just said, without our axial tilt, um, we'd have a real trouble surviving. And what our moon does is it keeps us locked on that axial tilt, stops the Earth from sort of wobbling around. Um, and also, along with the sun, the moon causes our tides. Um, and these tides would probably be around about half if we didn't have a moon. Interesting fact is that the moon is receding from the Earth. Um, so it's a, a rate of about 1.5 inches every year. Um, so as the moon orbits the Earth, it causes tides. And these tides that it causes gives the moon orbital energy. So the moon pushes itself 1.5 inches away from the Earth. Now that's pittance really, um, but it's a measurable amount and uh, that means that it's, it's very difficult to imagine that the moon and, and the Earth can be 4 billion years old. Um, because if you wind the clock back, the moon would have to be touching the Earth. Um, but of course, um, you, you, you uh, don't have a problem if you go back just several thousand years. Um, so, that's evidence from man. Um, the Earth and sort of space and, and the stars and, and creation. Uh, and I want to look at the Bible. So we've seen, okay, maybe there has to be something out there that um, created this. Um, what about the Bible? <coughs> um, one statement uh, or sometimes criticism that is a very often levelled against the Bible is that it, it isn't reliable um, and it's changed over time and that really it's nothing more than just a, a, a good storybook with very nice morals. Um, however, the Bible and particularly the New Testament <coughs> has a wealth, a very great supply of evidence to support its accuracy. So to say that the New Testament is not reliable, in, you also have to say that um, other authors and writers from around the same time are also very unreliable. Um, so Plato and Pliny, Aristotle and Homer. Um, there are currently over 5,000 Greek manuscripts in existence now. These manuscripts are written between 100 and 300 years after the original document is completed. The original New Testament was written just 70 years after the events it describes. So if we go through those again, we have 5,000 manuscripts written 100 to 300 years afterwards, so they're the copies, and the original was written just 70 years after the events it describes. So that is very close. Some of the people involved in the events described may well still have been alive, and they could check that document for accuracy. And also, they may have even just been around to see some of the first copies being started. Um, and that's um, not surprising then, when you pull up all of those facts together that you can um, see in the New Testament manuscripts something in what's called a, a very high textual purity. Um, so all of the copies are, are very similar. Yes, there are some minor changes in some of the details. Some of the manuscripts are, are missing certain verses here and there. Um, but uh, there's nothing that really affects the cohesion of the manuscripts. Um, 
and there's this is a very high textural purity. Um, and that's amazing when you compare to some of the sources from the same time. So there's usually at least a thousand year gap between the death of the author and the earliest copy available. Um, which already leaves them way behind the New Testament on the accuracy front. And add to that the lack of available copies, there's usually less than 20 copies available for, for the document. Um, so you can see some statistics on the slide here. Um, so, if we can believe in God, and if we can trust that the Bible is true and accurate, or well, the Bible says that it is the Word of God, so we can believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then what does this mean? Well, this means that you have to make a choice. Either you ignore God, and you live your own life, and then you die. Or, you've tried to listen to God, and to follow his commandments. So, and now I'm going to try and give you a very quick overview of what we believe. And whether you make your decision now, or you decide to think about it, this will try, uh, this, this will help you to um, make an informed decision. So, first things first. We believe in one God, creator of the heavens and the earth. Um, and now if we just think about uh, the time shortly after that um, creation, can you look with me at Genesis chapter 3? serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say to you, You shall not eat of any of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So after God had finished creating the world, he put Adam in the Garden of Eden with Eve and gave him just one rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you'll die. Simple enough. Um, but then the snake comes along and he discusses with Eve. So let's look at verse 4 and 5. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So the snake discusses with Eve, and he tells her a lie, that she will not die if she eats the fruit. Look at verse 6. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So Eve then takes another look at the fruit for herself, and she decides herself to eat it. Um, and then she gives them to Adam. So we'll now 
a look at verses 14 to 19. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, and thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. So God pronounces a series of curses on them. Um, look at verse 15. I'm trying to remember this for a second. The serpent represents sin and the world. Um, remember um, the uh, sorry. So there was enmity between the two of them. Uh, but sin will eventually be conquered by the woman's seed. Okay? Notice this seed here is singular. But in doing so, the serpent will return some damage and he will bruise his heel. And verse 19, here death is introduced into the world. So because Adam listened to Eve, and he sinned, he's responsible <coughs> for the introduction of death into the world. So there's those two things to remember there. Now come to Genesis chapter 12. So Abraham went up from Egypt, and, oops, sorry, no, that's 13. So the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, and from your kindred, and from your father's house, and to the land that I will show you. So God speaks to Abraham, who is later named Abraham, and um, he gives him this promise, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the nation was to become Israel, um, who are still here today, as we know. Um, even though many people have tried to eradicate them over the ages. Look at now Genesis chapter 22 and verse 16. Abraham listened to. Oh, don't again, sorry, one chapter. Uh, 22 verse 16. And said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham, I'm sure you'll be familiar with the story, was willing to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, for God. This was his only hope. Isaac was his only hope of continuing and becoming a nation. It was his only son. 
So this was showing great faith in God, willing to sacrifice his only son. And God, as we know, did not actually require him to sacrifice Isaac, although Abraham didn't know that at the time. But God wanted to see if he was willing to do it, and if he had the faith and the obedience. So therefore, when he sees that he does, God rewards him and reiterates the promise that we've seen in chapter 12 about them becoming a great nation. And this time, he includes the promise about a son. All the nations will be blessed in his seed. So the word for seed here, as we know, is meant to be interpreted as a descendant and not as descendants. Because the New Testament tells us. So, all of the Old Testament then is pointing forward to one particular person. Um, and this person is the Lord Jesus. He's the Son of God, and this is how he referred to himself, but he's also a man who was born of just a woman, uh, Mary. And this is very important because it allows him to understand how we feel. Jesus lived a sinless life. And, and he uh, didn't deserve to die. So when he went to die on a cross, that was his choice. And and because he was sinless, he didn't deserve to die on the cross. And so, after three days, he rose again. And um, that is why anyone who has faith in him and commits themselves to him can be saved. Um, Come with me to Hebrews and chapter 4. <coughs> so Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. <coughs> let us with every confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He can understand how we feel because he has been tempted in every way, like we are. Um, but he did never did any sin. His sacrifice can give us confidence to come to the throne of grace. Um, whatever we do, no matter what it is, we can ask for forgiveness. And we can be accepted as long as we come um, honestly and openly. So you can see that everything that we believe is bound up in Jesus. He was this seed of the woman. And he was heard for a while. Remember the thing about the bruised heel? Well, he was heard for a while when he destroyed sin. He spent those three days in the grave. It was a painful death. But he rose again. And he's this promised son to Abraham that was in the promises. And come to Acts chapter 1. And verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed in his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So when Jesus left, it was with a promise that he would return. When he returns, he is to set up this kingdom that we saw mentioned in verse 6 um, and he will reign over it as a perfect king the disciples then were, were sent out into the world and they preached the gospel and so this news spread and here we are today lastly we believe that Jesus will resurrect the faithful dead when he returns and please look at uh, John chapter 11. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, shall yet live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So Lazarus was dead, and he needed to be raised again in the short term as a miracle that Jesus performed, and, and we can read this in, in the Gospels. Um, but Martha confesses her faith here, and this is what we're in, we are interested in. Um, so, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Those who are faithful will be raised to an eternal life as part of that kingdom. Jesus will reign over. So then, I hope I've made you think. Faith is not chains. It's freedom from sin and death. The things that God wants from us are, not, are, are simple to understand. Although the only man ever to have achieved them is Jesus, he's not expecting us to be perfect. He is expecting us to try. Please come to Revelation 22, just to finish up. This is 20. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen.